Hello, and welcome to my show on civil rights. My name is Barbara Bullen, and I'm one of the radio hosts for the New Heights Show on Education and the New Heights Educational Group. I hope you enjoy the show, and I'm asking our listeners to consider becoming a sponsor. This show is pre-recorded. This show is based on the life of Frederick Douglass, who wrote three autobiographies. I will continue with the first, taken from en.wikipedia.org backslash wiki backslash narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. Douglass appendix clarifies that he is not against religion as a whole. Instead, he referred to the slave-holding religion of this land and with no possible reference to Christianity proper. He condemns the hypocrisy in Southern Christianity between what is taught and the actions of the slave owners who practice it. He compares their Christianity to the practices of the ancient scribes and Pharisees and quotes passages from Matthew 23 calling them hypocrites. At the end, he includes a satire of a hymn, said to have been drawn several years before the present anti-slavery agitation began by a Northern Methodist preacher who, while residing at the South, had an opportunity to see slaveholding morals, manners, and piety with his own eyes titled simply a parody. It criticizes religious slave owners each stanza ending with the phrase heavenly union mimicking the original's form. The narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass was published on May the 1st, 1845, and within four months of this publication, 5,000 copies were sold. By 1860, almost 30,000 copies were sold. After publication, he left Lynn Massachusetts and sailed to England and Ireland for two years in fear of being recaptured by his owner in the United States. While in Britain and Ireland, he gained supporters who paid $710.96 to purchase his emancipation from his legal owner. One of the more significant reasons Douglas published his narrative was to offset the demeaning manner in which white people viewed him. When he spoke in public, his white abolitionist associates established limits to what he could say on the platform. More specifically, they did not want him to analyze the current slavery issues or to shape the future for black people. However, once narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass was published, he was given the liberty to begin more ambitious work on the issue rather than given the same speeches repetitively. Because of the work in his narrative, Douglas gained significant credibility from those who previously did not believe the story of his past. While Douglas was in Ireland, the Dublin edition of the book was published by the abolitionist printer Richard D. Webb. To great acclaim, and Douglas would write extensively in later editions very positively about his experience in Ireland. His newfound liberty on the platform eventually led him to start a black newspaper against the advice of his fellow abolitionists. The publication of Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass opened several doors, not only for Douglass's ambitious work, but also for the anti-slavery movement of that time. Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass received many positive reviews, but there was a group of people who opposed Douglass's work. One of his biggest critics, A. C. C. Thompson, was a neighbor of Thomas Auld, who was the master of Douglas for some time. As seen in Letter from a Slaveholder by A. C. C. Thompson, found in the Norton Critical Edition of Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, he claimed that the slave he knew was an unlearned and rather an ordinary Negro. Thompson was confident that Douglas was not capable of writing the narrative. He also disputed the narrative when Douglas described the various cruel white slaveholders 
that he either knew or knew of. Prior to the publication of narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, the public could not fathom how it was possible for a former slave to appear to be so educated. Upon listening to his oratory, many were skeptical of the stories he told. After Douglass's publication, however, the public was swayed. Also found in the Norton Critical Edition, Margaret Fuller, a prominent book reviewer and literary critic of that era, had a high regard of Douglas's work. She claimed, We have never read a narrative more simple, true, coherent, and warm with genuine feeling. She also suggested that everyone may read his book and see what a mind might have been stifled in bondage, what a man may be subjected to the insults of spendthrift dandies or the blows of mercenary brutes, in whom there is no whiteness except of the skin, no humanity in the outward form. Douglas's work in this narrative was an influential piece of literature in the anti-slavery movement. Influence on Contemporary Black Studies Angela Y. Davis analyzed Douglas's narrative in two lectures delivered at UCLA in 1969 titled Recurring Philosophical Themes in Black Literature. Those lectures were subsequently published during Davis's imprisonment in 1970 to 1971 as a 24 page pamphlet, Lectures on Liberation. The lectures, along with two, a 2009 introduction by Davis, were republished in Davis's 2010 New Critical Edition of the narrative. Right now, you might be struggling through your classes or even failing them. You might be worried that you may not finish high school. There might have even been a thought that you may not be smart enough. Well, the New Heights Educational Group begs to differ. We not only think you are smart enough, but with our help, you will complete your high school diploma. The New Heights Educational Group strives to improve your academic success through its tutoring services. To learn more, please visit newheightseducation.org and contact us. New Heights Educational Group, educational resources to help reach your goals. Hello, listeners. If you're enjoying the New Heights show on education and want to support or donate to our organization, please visit www.newheightseducation.org. And while you're there, check out our online store, Welcome back to the New Height Show on Education. My name is Barbara Bullen and I'm the radio host for this show. This show is pre-recorded and focuses on the history of civil rights. A recap of the first segment of the show on Frederick Douglass will continue. The first chapter of this text has also been mobilized in several major texts that have become foundational texts in contemporary black studies. Hortense Spillers in her article, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American Grammar Book, 1987. Sadea Hartman in her book, Scenes of Subjection, Terror, Slavery, and Self-Making in 19th Century America, 1997 and Fred Morton in his book, In the Break, The Aesthetics of the Black Radical Tradition, 2003. Each author uniquely contends with and navigates through Douglas's writing. Specifically, each author has a divergent approach to revisiting or reproducing narratives of the suffering enslaved body. These divergences on Douglas are further reflected in their differing explorations of the condition where subject and object positions of the enslaved body are produced and are troubled. Spillers mobilizes Douglas's description of his and his siblings early separation from their mother and subsequent estrangement from each other to articulate how the syntax of subjectivity in particular kinship has a historically specific relationship to the objectifying formations of chattel slavery 
which denied genetic links and familiar bonds between the enslaved. This denial was part of the processes that worked to reinforce the enslaved position as property and object. Spillers frames Douglas's narrative as writing that, although frequently returned to, still has the ability to astonish contemporary readers with each return to this scene of enslaved grief and loss. Spillers, Mama's Baby, page 76. By tracing the historical conditions of captivity through which slave humanity is defined as absence from a subject position, narratives like Douglas Chronicles of the Middle Passage and Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl are framed as impression points that have not lost their effective potential or become problematically familiar through repetitions or revisions. Spillers, Mama's Baby, page 66. Spillers own revisitation of Douglas' narrative suggests that these efforts are a critical component to her assertion that in order for me to speak a truer word concerning myself, I must strip down through layers of attenuated meanings made an, ex made an excess in time, over time, assigned by a particular historical order, and there await whatever marvels of my own inventiveness, Spillers, Mama's Baby, page 65. In, con in contrast to Spillers' articulation that reputation does not rob Douglas's narrative of its power, Sadea Hartman explores how an over-familiarity with narratives of the suffering and slave body is problematic. In Hartman's work, repeated exposure of the violated body is positioned as a process that can lead to a benumbing indifference to suffering. Hartman, Scenes of Objection, page 4. This turn away from Douglas's description of the violence carried out against his aunt Hester is contextualized by Hartman's critical examination of 19th century abolitionist writings in the antebellum South. These abolitionist narratives included extreme representations of violence carried out against the enslaved body, which were included to establish the slave's humanity and invoke empathy while exposing the terrors of the institution. However, Hartman posits that these abolitionist efforts, which may have intended to convey enslaved subjectivities, actually align more closely to replications of objectivity, since they reinforce the thingly quality of the captive by reducing the body to evidence. Hartman, Scenes of Subjection, page 19. Instead of concentrating on these narratives that dramatize violence and the suffering black body, Hartman is more focused on revealing the quotidian ways that enslaved personhood and, and objectivity were selectively constructed or brought into tension in scenes like the Coffell, coerced performances of slave leisure on the plantation and the popular theater of the antebellum South. Fred Moton's engagement with narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass Echo Spiller's assertion that every writing as a revision makes the discovery all over again. Spiller's page 69. In his book chapter, Resistance of the Object, Aunt Hester's Scream, he speaks to Hartman's move, move away from Aunt Hester's experience of violence. Moton questions whether Hartman's opposition to reproducing this narrative is not actually a direct move through a relationship between violence and the captive body positioned as object that she had intended to avoid. Moulton suggests that as Hartman outlines the reason for her opposition, her written reference to the narrative and the violence of its content may indeed be an inevitable reproduction. This is reflected in his question of whether performance in general is ever outside the economy of reproduction. Moulton in the break, page 4. A key parameter in Moulton's analytical method and the way he engages with Hartman's work is an exploration of blackness as a positional framework through which objectivity and humanity are performed. This suggests that an attempt to move beyond the violence and object position of Aunt Hester would always be first a move through these things. 
Through this framework of the performativity of blackness, Moulton's revisitation of Douglas' narrative explores how the sounds of black performance might trouble conventional understanding of subjectivity and subjective speech. With the second autobiography written by Frederick Douglass is My Bondage and My Freedom. With each week, I will read to you certain portions of each chapter. The ebook can be downloaded from https colon backslash backslash www.guttenberg.org slash files slash 202 slash 202 dash h backslash 202 dash h dot htm my bondage and my freedom by frederick Douglass. by a principle essential to christianity a person is essentially differenced from a thing so that the idea of a human being necessarily excludes the idea of property in that being Coleridge entered according to Act of Congress in 1855 by Frederick Douglass in the clerk's office of the District Court of the Northern District of New York to Honorable Jarrett Smith as a slight token of esteem for his character admiration for his genius and benevolence affection for his person and gratitude for his friendship and as a small but most sincere acknowledgement of his preeminent services in behalf of the rights and liberties of an afflicted, despised, and deeply outraged people by ranking slavery with piracy and murder, and by denying it either a legal or constitutional existence, this volume is respectfully dedicated by his faithful and firmly attached friend, friend Frederick Douglass, Rochester, New York. My Bondage and My Freedom, Editor's Preface. If the volume now presented to the public were a mere work of art, the history of its misfortune might be written in two very simple words, too late. The nature and character of slavery have been subject of an almost endless variety of artistic representation. And after the brilliant achievements in that field, and while those achievements are yet fresh in the memory of the million, he who would add another to the legion must possess the charm of transcendent excellence or apologize for something worse than rashness. The reader is therefore assured with all due promptitude that his attention is not invited to a work of art, but to a work of facts, facts terrible and almost incredible it may be yet facts nevertheless. I am authorized to say that there is not a fictitious name nor place in the whole volume, but that names and places are liter literally given and that every transaction therein described actually transpired. Perhaps the best preface to this volume is furnished in the following letter of Mr. Douglas, written in answer to my urgent solicitation for such a work. Rochester, New York, July the 2nd, 1855. Dear friend, I have long entertained, as you very well know, a somewhat positive repugnance to writing or speaking anything for the public, which could, with any degree of plausibility, make me liable to the imputation of seeking personal notoriety for its own sake. Entertaining that feeling very sincerely and permitting its control, perhaps quite unreasonably, I have often refused to narrate my personal experience in public anti-slavery meetings and in sympathizing circles when urged to do so by friends, with whose views and wishes ordinarily it were a pleasure to comply. In my letters and speeches I have generally aimed to discuss the question of slavery in the light of fundamental principles and upon facts notorious and open to all, making, I trust, no more of the fact of my own former enslavement than circumstances seemed absolutely to require. I have never placed my opposition to slavery on a basis so narrow as my own enslavement, but rather upon the indestructible and unchangeable laws of human nature, every one of which is perpetually and flagrantly violated by the slave system. 
I have also felt that it was best for those having histories worth the writing, or supposed to be so, to commit such work to hands other than their own, to write of oneself in such a manner as not to incur the imputation of weakness, vanity, and egotism, is a work within the ability of but few, and I have little reason to believe that I belong to that fortunate few. These considerations cause me to hesitate, when first you kindly urge me to prepare for publication a full account of my life as a slave and my life as a freeman. Nevertheless, I see, with you, many reasons for regarding my autobiography as exceptional in its character and as being in some sense naturally beyond the reach of those reproaches which honourable and sensitive minds dislike to incur. It is not to illustrate any heroic achievements of a man, but to vindicate a just and beneficent principle in its application to the whole human family by letting in the light of truth upon a system esteemed by some as a blessing, by others as a curse and a crime. I agree with you that the system is now at the bar of public opinion, not only of this country, but of the whole civilized world, for judgment. Its friends have made for it the usual plea, not guilty. The case must therefore proceed. Any facts, either from slaves, slaveholders or bystanders, calculated to enlighten the public mind by revealing the true nature, character and tendency of the slave system, are in order and can scarcely be innocently withheld. I see too that there are special reasons why I should write my own biography, in preference to employing another to do it. Not only is slavery on trial, but unfortunately the enslaved people are also on trial. It is alleged that they are naturally inferior, that they are so low in the scale of humanity and so utterly stupid that they are unconscious of their wrongs and do not apprehend their rights. Looking then at your request from this standpoint and wishing everything of which you think me capable to go to the benefit of my afflicted people, I part without doubts and hesitation and proceed to furnish you the desired manuscript, hoping that you may be able to make such arrangements for its publication as shall be best adapted to accomplish that good which you so enthusiastically anticipate. Frederick Douglass There was little necessity for doubt and hesitation on the part of Mr. Douglass as to the propriety of his giving to the world a full account of himself. A man who was born and brought up in slavery, a living witness of his horrors, who often himself experienced its cruelties, and who, despite the depressing influences surrounding his birth, youth and manhood, has risen from a dark and almost absolute obscurity to this distinguished position which he now occupies, might very well assume the existence of a commendable curiosity on the part of the public to know the facts of this remarkable history. Editor Introduction When a man raises himself from the lowest condition in society to the highest, mankind pay him the tribute of their admiration. When he accomplishes this elevation by native energy, guided by prudence and wisdom, their admiration is increased. But when his course, onward and upward, excellent in itself, Furthermore, proves it possible what had hitherto been regarded as an impossible reform. Then he becomes a burning and a shining light on which the aged may look with gladness, the young with hope, and the downtrodden as a representative of what they may themselves become. To such a man, dear reader, it is my privilege to introduce you. The life of Frederick Douglass recorded in the pages which follow is not merely an example of self-elevation under the most adverse circumstances, it is, moreover, a noble vindication of the highest aims of the American anti-slavery movement. The real object of that movement is not only to disenthrall, it is also to bestow upon the Negro the exercise of all those rights from the possession of which he has been so long debarred. But this full recognition of the colored man to the right and the entire admission of the same to the full privileges political religious and social of manhood 
requires powerful effort on the part of the enthralled, as well as on the part of those who would disenthrall them. The people at large must feel the conviction as well as admit the abstract logic of human equality. The Negro, for the first time in the world's history, brought in full contact with high civilization, must prove his title first to all that is demanded from him for him. In the teeth of an unequal chances, he must prove himself equal to the mass of those who oppress him therefore absolutely superior to his apparent fate and to their relative ability and it's and it is most cheering to the friends of freedom today that evidence of this equality is rapidly accumulating not from the ranks of the half-freed colored people of the free states but from the very depths of slavery itself the indestructible equality of man to man is demonstrated by the ease with which black men scarce one removed from barbarism if slavery can be honored with such a distinction, vault into the high places of the most advanced and painfully acquired civilization. Ward and Garnett, Wells, Brown and Pennington, Logan and Douglas are banners on the outer wall under which abolition is fighting its most successful battles. Because they are living exemplars of the practicability of the most radical abolitionism for they were all of them born to the doom of slavery. Some of them remain slaves until adult age, yet they all have not only one equality to their white fellow citizens in civil, religious, political and social rank, but they have also illustrated and adorned our common country by their genius, learning and eloquence. This comes to the conclusion of the show. Next week's show will continue on the autobiography of Frederick Douglass my bondage, and my freedom. Thank you for listening. You can reach me by email, barbarab at newheightseducation.org. Be sure to join me every Sunday at radio.newheightseducation.org, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, as I discuss the history of civil rights. Also join Pamela Clark's pre-recorded shows, which airs Wednesday by 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Civil rights is our right. Have a great week. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget to rate us and follow us on your podcast player. Check out our show page, radio.newheightseducation.org, for monthly announcements and other happenings.